And um, this is my brother, Jim. Um, Jared was born on the 25th of March, 1950. He was fourth of five children in our family, with my brothers, Frank and Jim, my sister, Noel, and myself. He had a shock of mad red hair, which gave him the nickname Red Hugh. But uh, Jared was educated at Anna Moore Primary School, but his interest definitely didn't lay in books. <laughs> it lay in sport. He was a skilled footballer, but his ability was never realised. And in later years, he turned to snooker, and in different circumstances, would probably have been a very successful snooker player. He won the Northern Ireland Amateur title in 1968. Uh, when Jared left school, then he moved on to employment in Kelly's yard pipe making factory. He led a normal social life with dancing and football and snooker. Girls. And girls. <laughs> and life had seemed to have set its pattern. Um, our house at home was always a great Kaylian house, with friends like the neighbours of the Donnellys, the Dorses, and Anthony Higgins, always frequent callers. In 1968, Jared went to England to play in a, a snooker tournament and stayed there for a while, and then on his return the civil rights movement was in big swing at the time, and he immediately got involved. With the outbreak of hostilities at that time, Jared then joined the IRA. He was a courageous volunteer who inspired his comrades and struck fear in his enemies. My brother Frank, for many years, um, suffered muscular dystrophy, and he drove a three-wheeled in Bleak Car, which a, f a family friend at that time nicknamed the car the Claudia. This, however, did not deter him from doing his bit, even though he couldn't walk. He often ferried Jared all around the local roads from place to place with the obligatory complement of rifles on board the car, <laughs> which my mother and father at that time would have been very scared and always worried about him. Jared was then arrested in November 1970 and charged with alleged possession of a Claymore mine in the Gaelic pitch across from where we lived. Whilst in custody he received many severe beatings, yet such torture only went to reinforce him in his commitment to the struggle. He was released in October 1971 and immediately went into activities again. At that time, the murder of George best friend, Kevin Kilpatrick, by the UDR had a, a great effect on his life. George was re-arrested again in June 1973 and interned in Long Cash. While he was there, all his comrades within the prison referred to him as George, which we as a family never understood where this George come from. Um, Jared being Jared, escape was always high priority on his mind. And after several frustrating attempts, a tunnel was eventually completed. Whilst emerging from that tunnel in November 74, Jared was cold-bloodedly shot dead. In the back? In the back. He, as it was, he was the very first to emerge from the tunnel at that time. I remember I got the work at 5 o'clock in the morning, for a fraud come on that on we were late on that how you find out about When the police come after when the police come after that after the year after fast for mm. I'll show you in any about And even at that time I think because they called him George was that a reason maybe uh -huh. Jim that they thought that there was a, a slight possibility that it was somebody different. Uh -huh. That it was a very slight yeah. possibility that it was somebody different. And then the news was properly brought through that it was Jared at that stage. And then, as I say, news of the killing just brought hundreds of workers in the Tyrone area out in sympathy with the family and the anger and disgust at the slaying of Jared, who was, after all, following an international time honoured tradition of escape. The order they made is a job of honour, a funeral, and they were all out. The, the, the whole time they were standing beside the coffin, and then they took shifts in the bedroom, they would come back up again and all that. That's really all I mean about it. It's just there's thousands of people just in and out of the house all the time, just. And then what about the wee monk that come to my mother? 
she could create comfort as a wee monk come with no only sandals and this big brown gown on him and he was mommy just got so comfort he sat for hours with mommy at that time I don't know when he was a chaplain and non cash or what he was he at was that time he was chaplain but apart from that I think just the shock of it with you don't realise you think it's happening to somebody else and mm -hmm. right after that happened you're taken into these cars and you were driven away to the mortuary in Lagan Valley and like that was you just thought you were in another, another world, just that it wasn't happening to you at all. No. And it was you and Kathleen Dawes? Yes, you and I I didn't go in the door. And he was laying in the middle, and there's a body here and a body here, and the two bodies were the, the British soldiers. Covered. I blew up. That had been. Just that. Because of Jerry at that, that time. Really? That's really all I mean about and then been brought home and when he was in the coffin there was just this massive big wound right up the... Oh, up here. Up here and right the up the... Up to come up here and up there. And it was just whatever way they'd sold him or fixed him up, it was horrendous to look at. But, but there would have been no other way for Jared, I no. don't think. Well, oh, um, Ma used to always say he's still on church. He'll be safe. safe. Yep. safe. I was all his own words, he's safe where he is. Because whenever he was out and about, he was flying about the roads, and at one stage there was a message come over a radio for to get Jared Coney dead or alive. I think he was in the parochial centre that night with Elish, at a dance, I can't remember. And in many an hour night, we were down the Arbo Road looking for him and trying to see where he was and meeting him by a carload of boys. And there was a roadblock maybe about a mile up the road, oh. trying to get him torn and well, get him away well, from him. Well, he's in the church, he uh, applied, no, you could have played it, you could get out and you look in front of one, a judge, and the judge says, I know where, uh, this man is an, an offer to slack for a bridge. That's right. So he says, I know where, uh, so he didn't I get it, he's put back in. And there's actually a photograph of him there with a wee girl, a wee neighbour, the hair dyed jet black. Oh, it was young, yeah, but it's tried to disguise there. <laughs> he, he was, which was impossible. Uh -huh. But then, as I said, the funeral was huge with people coming from all over Ireland. And he was buried in Tano Graveyard in a fine Republican plot which was erected by local people. Which we find a fitting tribute to his memory as, as family. I am Mary McGlinchey, sister of Brian Campbell. Brian was born on the 24th of March 1964. He is the fifth in a family of eight, six boys and two girls to Brenton and Kathleen Campbell. Brian attended St Patrick's Primary School on of Moor, St Joseph's Secondary Colliden and then to the Tack in Dungan. Like a lot he didn't hate school but he certainly didn't love it. He just done enough to get him through it. On leaving school Brian joined the family business and trained as a mechanic under his father, Uncle Peter and older bros, Jimmy, Peter and Michael. He loved cars and had his own stock car, stock car at the age of 13. He was in Clonoe Boxing Club and had an interest in football, more a supporter than a player. He attended all the local matches and was at Crook Park many a time. He enjoyed Irish music and went to a few Irish classes to learn to speak Irish but there was too much coding about and there was only a few basic words learned. Brian forged his age for driving and after passing the test, soon got on the road. He travelled near and far with his friends. If you were stuck for a lift home from dances or anywhere, he would have told you, pile on in. The car would have been packed to the roof, no seat belts then. Brian was very witty, kind hearted, good natured and very obliging. He was always willing to help anyone at any time. He helped Patrick and myself and our children move into our new house on the Thursday night before he died. Both him and Colin McGuire, now Colin, who was my husband's uncle, were down over the weekend visiting and all they wanted to know was when our housewarming would be. Couldn't you imagine the pair of them boys at a housewarming that had partied all night? Brian's first holiday out of Ireland was to America in March 83 
with the Clonoa Rally Club. He loved it so much he nearly didn't come home. Reflecting on the early days of the Troubles, November 1974 was a tragic time for our family and for our community. Sadly, we lost our brother Declan, age 8, from a brain tumour. The full impact of the Troubles hit locally with the death of our neighbour, Jared Coney, who was shot escaping from Long Cash and the murder by loyalist of Pat Falls, Mahamul. News came to my house about Brian and Colin's death on that Sunday evening. Patrick, myself, Patrick and myself had to go to my parents' house to tell them the awful news. Ursula and Dolan had only come in from a teenage disco that was held in the boxing club. We broke the news and as you would imagine, it broke them and us. We were all shattered. Both my parents are very religious. As children, we were made to say their family rosy every night of the week, no matter what. On hearing the news, my father, a great presence of mind, lifted the phone and phoned our local priest, Father Joe Campbell. He also phoned Paddy Duffy, our family solicitor. Now, Paddy was my father's cousin, and Paddy had a nephew, Paul, shot in our bow by the Brits. So he knew what to do in these circumstances and to help both families. Shimi, who had escaped from Long Cash in September of that year, we had a good news to him, so we got news through a difficult but safe channel. We all had to be very careful. The day for Brian took a heavy toll on our family, especially our mother and father, and unfortunately our father Brenton was to die tragically in an accident at the garage where he worked, uh, he was electrocuted in August 1987. I'm uh, Mickey Campbell from Clano, I'm a brother Brian. Brian uh, was shot by the SAS uh, 25 years ago this year. He would have been a jack of lads sort of a lad. He was, you know, he was living his life to the full and uh, he would have been, you know, just sort of up to all sorts. Um, his biggest love, as I say, was cars, stock cars. He used to fix up stock cars. He used to always go and uh, buy oil cars and do them up. I can remember one time he done up an oil. It was uh, an F45. The engine was seized and he used to take it up the field and stock her, stock her around. But he done it up and she was the talk of the country at that particular time. So she was. But uh, as times went on, as it was a bit things got a bit more stressed with the troubles and Brian was no different to I suppose everybody else in the neighbourhood was getting a lot of stopping and harassment like the rest of the family. I suppose that influenced his life a lot. Um, he would have been running around with a whole lot of the local lads as, as they would have been doing at the time. They sort of were always would have been running to the football matches and going out to dances. And he would have been most 17 or 18 when he started driving. Well, maybe he was driving before that on the roads anyway. Or the, the ladders. He would have been buying it, or not buying, but maybe taking a ladder out in an evening and going to all the local hotspots. I can remember one night he was coming home from Cookstown and he had an accident at Hardy's Cross Road. He took an electric pole down and an old green ladder. But that didn't stop him like because the boys threw her back over on her side and they took her and they pulled her back down to the down home and they pulled her up the field and hit her up the field and there was another green ladder, the same, same colour, but he took a number of plates off the smashed one and he put them on. <laughs> He put them onto the green one and he went on about his business and nobody was any the wiser. Or things that was ten a penny, you know. <laughs> that was some of the antics he was just renowned for. Uh, he sort of was, he was very happy go lucky, I know that. And he wasn't um, too worried about things in, in his life. I don't think he was just happy go lucky. Uh, Whenever Brian was shot, it was a Sunday evening or Sunday during the day. 
I was at, up at my own house, I was married with a, with a young child at the time, and I didn't know that anything had happened at all. And it was in the evening time, maybe five or six o'clock, and Mary's husband Patrick came to the door and he says, he told me that there was a, been a shooting, and there's been two people shot, and they think that Brian was one of them, along with his own cousin, Colin McGuire. So I found this very, very hard to believe. You know, that this had happened, it was complete shock, devastation. Knew Brian was involved with the IRA, knew he was a volunteer, and knew that he w it was a possibility. It was always a possibility that those who never they were involved that this could happen. But we went down to the house, my, my wife and I went down to the house, and it was pandemonium. My ma had tried to get to these remains and they wouldn't let her in to these remains, along with one of the local priests. And uh, things was, as I said, very sketchy. The news was, it wasn't good anyway. We were yeah, that, because we weren't, like, stupid. We knew that it was right. It soon became apparent it was a stakeout by the SAS, and they had went to inspect a dump. But Brian and Callum obviously had walked into the trap. And the night anyway that they were shot then, they were, we needed to get to the, uh, down to the morgue. They'd removed these remains anyway, down to Craig Avon. And me and my dad went. And uh, a couple of other uncles, Uncle Sean and Uncle James, had went also. But when we got down to the morgue, the mortician, he came out and he gasped for the details of who was going to identify Brian and that. So my father and myself had went in to identify him and for a strange moment or two we couldn't, we didn't really think it was him. But it was only, I suppose, denying the situation we knew rightly. But it was Brian and Brian was just himself lying as if he was sleeping and he was soaked. He was soaking, I suppose, just like pulled in, left on a slab, and that was that. And as time went on, anyway, then the remains were to be lifted. And there was a whole lot of hassle and a whole lot of security around that. And the police and all were making it as bloody awkward as they could. Well, I suppose it was the, the, the norm for them. They, they were just making it completely as awkward. And, as I had for the time as I could do it for the family. The people, the neighbours was ra rallying round and they were so good, all the neighbours were so good and the people that came from everywhere and uh, kept the remains in the house. I'm Sammy, uh, Brian's oldest brother. Uh, I suppose the whole history of Brian has to be put in context of the times that were in it. During the 70s, in our area, there was a lot of trouble going on, a lot of shootings going on. The troubles were just uh, starting up. I got involved myself in the troubles of the early 70s, through my family around, and then through the IRA. And I've been an active IRA man uh, throughout that period. Uh, uh, inevitably, the house began being raided in the 70s and uh, there'd be arrests, I'd be uh, arrested, taken out of golf barracks or Omer barracks or most of the barracks, I've done most of the barracks, uh, people would have been arrested and it's, it's quite traumatic for a house to be raided, uh, all the family would be taken out of bed four or five in the morning, they'd all be taken up, put in one room and we would be uh, geared up, ready for the lift, three days or seven days, expecting it. But you never really had much uh, consideration for the rest of the family, younger members, and they had to go through all this sort of ordeal. And it was the same for everyone, and Mary and Ursula, and Mickey, and Brian, and my mum and dad. And, uh, it got to be the house if a, if a balloon burst in Dungan, they'd raid our house and uh, there'd be, once it got to be the house was raid that much, we would fight them, 
the scraps, fights, my farm in particular. Uh, I often fought them. We would have fought the Brits, the police. It was just a baiting session a lot of the time. And uh, I remember one time the, uh, the come, there was a fellow shot on uh, the come and raided our house looking for me and uh, the RUC raided the house and, and they held my father down on the ground and beat him in one carbine to the back street. And Brian was there, I remember they, they held me and beat my father in front of him. And Brian was only a lad watching this. So on this hill I have a, a big impact on his life. Uh, he was young at the time, happy go lucky, playing football, he had his stock car. I remember fixing a stock car and going down to Jim Donnelly's field and rallying it around the field and we were winning the race and the car conked out. So there was a lot of slag and a lot of crack and all. Eventually I was arrested in, in June 80 and uh, sent to jail. The, he would have come down to visit me and there was a lot of slagging going on and I knew, kind of knew what was happening but I didn't, I never asked him. And uh, he would be stopped and I'd say, well, they're asking about me and he'd say, no, you're, you're an old, an old time and you're gone, I forgot about you. So uh, I know the visit, <clears throat> the last visit I had was, was a week before the escape, he came down to see me. And, uh, I couldn't really say much, but I did. I remember saying I'm going to go for a jog some Sunday here, and he kind of picked up on it, but he didn't. He didn't know. So anyway, we escaped, and uh, as soon as we escaped, her over the border, and he sent a message and he was looking to see me. So uh, at this stage, he has been arrested himself. He has been lifted. He is getting the beatings. He is getting all the hassle. But he wanted to come down to see me. I was up along the border, and we were pretty. Things were pretty hot at the time, so we couldn't. We kept moving about and our living rough and moving. I couldn't get arrangements made to see him, but I did send a message back saying as soon as things, I'd see him. You know, I'd see him somewhere as soon as things had sorted out. On the day he was shot, myself and uh, Pardon McCarney were in the up along the border. And uh, we were we were living out in the we were living in the mountains sort of things. And uh, I remember having a very vivid dream the night before it that uh, that that Brian was shot. And I, I sort of was a bit scared. But we come back across a very very wet Sunday up there. We come across the border, come across the fields to the house, safe house, and the woman in the house brought us in and she said there's been a very bad shooting in the island. There's two men shot dead and I says that's myself and Pardon McCarney was there and I says that's Brian. And he says well, actually, you can't be sure. I says it's him he's gone. And uh, we got a drop of tea and we checked it out a couple of hours later the word came through that he that Brian was dead. So it was pretty it was a pretty horrific time being on the run, not being able to go up and it was a tough time. So basically, that's this is, there's lots of stories and lots of other detail you could go into, but that's that's my last memory there. And it was a tough time with my own father. And I don't know if my father ever got over it. The funeral then was being arranged, and it was uh, three days, I think, later, and they had the two days later they had the funeral, and. Uh, a huge crowd had turned up for it. There was people from everywhere, all over Ireland. There was messages from people all over the world had come sympathy to the family. And my parents, they never, I don't know, they just could not cope the whole way through it. It was, I would say, the nights, the nights of the week so hard it was unbelievable. I can remember being there every night, my dad being there every night, and him just crying the whole time. It was um, an awful loss to him, especially him being in the garage. I suppose you would say he was a favourite too, to be honest. Yes. The funeral up to Clannow Chapel, we walked to Clannow Chapel and 
The police was all about, the army was all about, the helicopters was all about, and we carried on and they on up, but there was no, they didn't stop us or nothing, there was no guard of honour at that stage. And the local priest said the mass, the Rakim mass, and then Bram was taken out to the burial with full uh, honours, IRA honours. And it was something that I was glad that happened. So it was because it would have been a fitting tribute to him, because it was something that he was he believed in, and it was a fitting way to remember him. And I was so glad that it actually happened. And they took him and buried him in the family plot alongside Daclan. Same grave now my father buried him. Uh, premature deaths, the three of them. Um, my name is uh, Brian McGuire, and uh, I'm brother of Colin McGuire, who was murdered by the SAS on December the 4th, 1983. Colin was the youngest of a family of 12. He had eight brothers and three sisters. Um, basically, the troubles really started for Colin when he was about 10 years old, when uh, the house, our house commander of a lot of British Army raids for internment and was raided every maybe every month, every three weeks. We were getting raids looking for Colin's older brother, Peter. This went on for several years. And Colin probably just grew up on the whole thing. And afterwards, after three years or so later, and Colin was about 12, I was sent to prison myself. <coughs> that meant Colin was further added to the whole political trouble here. He constantly visited me and uh, Basically then, while I was inside, Colin himself got involved. Well, Colin went to uh, the Primate Dixon School in Kalil, and then a large family like ours, when Sandy Claus or something come to the town, my mother maybe send me with Colin, give us sixpence each to go into the parcel. And I always remember with great delight on the story, I remember the time that Colin myself went to St. Patrick's Hall, we were only about five years, five or six years of age. and. We had to queue up over to six months to get a parcel of Sandy clothes. Well, after that, our parcel, which wasn't, in them days wouldn't have been much, we could see up at the top of the hall an awful rattling much of this. It sounded like, you know, a big wheel going around and rattling, so we ended up. And it was a very smoky area, as everybody then smoked, and you could see then it was the man wanted these numbers. It was a bazaar. So we sat up on, I don't know, the side of the hall, the rest of the bazaar, and see these people winning prizes. And lo and behold, then Colin ran across the floor. And on the floor, there was all the tickets. And one of these tickets was the same colour as the tickets to get a parcel of Sandy clothes. So I always remember Colin coming to me with the tickets, and he ran over to me with the tickets. And the two of us queued up and queued up till we continuously get at these parcels all the time off Sandy clothes. Even though Sandy clothes never catched on, we were continuously coming up. But I always remember the last of them coming down. <coughs> We'd head back into the smoky area where all the others were playing the bazaar and hide all our parcels in a big bag until Sandy Clark ran out of parcels. We uh, run down to a wee dump of parcels. Oh, must have maybe 10 or 12 these presents from Sandy Clark. And uh, just 